Hello, welcome to I'm Alan Nassan. This is a part three of three of uh, spending a little bit of time with uh, one of our great residents here, uh, Dr. Stephanie Jew, who is sharing three of these uh, cases that she recently did with our audience and talking about the different aspects of the case from literature point of view and the quick and to the point. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, thank you so much for uh, doing this. Thank Let's get to the third case, learn something from it. Okay, great. So the third case I had was a patient who presented to me from teaching practices and the dental student had started the root canal, had gotten to the cone shot and while they were doing the cone shot noticed that the cone wasn't going in the position that it wanted and ultimately realized that they had a perforation on the distal. Now while they were taking file shots during the procedure you can see that the clamp was kind of blocking exactly where the perforation was so that's why they kind of got so far in the procedure before they really realized it. Can we stop right here and just kind of share one little tip here is that when you get premolars that have been already prepped, if you will, or losing a lot of tooth structure because of caries, mm -hmm. when you isolate that individual tooth, right, especially when you have adjacent teeth that are missing and you have teeth that have been tilted as a result of the natural movement of these teeth, mm -hmm. you're going to end up getting disoriented big time. So these types of cases, it is okay to not use the rubber dam at the beginning, especially in the maxilla where you don't have to worry about and access until you get to the pulp and then put the rubber dam on. Or if you don't have an assistant and it's, you know, you prefer to have the, uh, the rubber dam on to isolate the back molar and pull it over a few teeth forward because that's the way you're going to be able to transfer the knowledge of the radiography of the teeth and this, the orientation of the teeth into the tooth. So this is the way you can avoid perforations. I can tell you from my clinical experience and what I've seen around is that most of the perforations we end up seeing are actually in premolars. And they're very easy teeth to access in these cases. but. People kind of rush because it's an easy access. They put the rubber dam on, now they're only seeing one tooth, mm -hmm. and they go invariably either perforating distally or mesially mm -hmm. due to the tilt of the tooth. Sorry to interrupt, go ahead. Yeah, looks like that's exactly what happened here. So uh, just a quick literature review on perforation repairs. So 1996 Fuss and Trope showed that the size, location, and time of repair are three things that really significantly affect the, affect the prognosis. So if you had a small intrabony perforation that was sealed immediately, that's going to generally have a pretty positive prognosis. Another paper that just kind of looked at MTA in repairing furcal perforations by Ford in 1995 described the cementum formation that uh, occurs beneath the MTA followed by the reformation of the PDL and that you really can get that normal bony architecture back with an MTA repair. And then another study from 2014 showed that the success rate of MTA perforation per repair with a minimum of a one-year follow-up was about 86%, so still generally pretty high. Yeah, it is very high and that's the beauty of it. So basically what we get from these three studies is that the new model materials of bioceramics, which includes MTA, you know, uh, putty and the uh, uh, biodentine and, and so on that are the, the only three that are really time proven mm -hmm. are the better materials but still the factors are time which is how quickly we repair the, the perforation and whether there was contamination at the time of perforation you know it's the same thing with pulp capping right I mean mm -hmm. if you don't have a rubber dam and you get contamination there's a lot of decay that's a different prognosis than if you do an accidental kind of a nicking of the pulp where you have a clean isolation you don't get any more uh, bacteria introduced into the pulp the perforations and pulp repairs seem to be kind of following the same logic size of the perforation increases the diameter and the circumference of seal becomes the question here mm -hmm. and uh, so if you get a perforation on a tooth the most sound advice, uh, Stephanie, would probably be to, to repair right away, right? right so right that's away very important not sort of. to waste time. In this case, it definitely wasn't ideal. There was some time between when I saw the patient and when the dental student had perforated, but um, I think we still were able to achieve a pretty good outcome. So these are some of the initial radiographs. The dental student had just been instructed to put calcium hydroxide in the area, and that had been pretty stable. So then when I saw the patient, um, he really wasn't having any symptoms with it at the time. Initially I saw the patient and we weren't able to complete the repair. We had just kind of done some of the work up and I ended up putting some more calcium hydroxide in and bringing him back for another appointment. We had to go over his medical history at a pretty complex medical history and make sure that he was cleared for treatment and everything before we went ahead and did too much. So we placed the calcium hydroxide, had a little bit of a calcium hydroxide extrusion um, that we kind of followed over time to make sure it resorbed. And because of his medical history, he was kind of canceling a lot of appointments and the time of repair wasn't as, deal, as ideal as we would have liked it to be. But we ended up getting him in and were able to achieve a, a really nice final result and we could see that the calcium hydroxide had resorbed in the sinus there. 
Terrific. So took images of exactly how the perforation repair was done. So you can see the perforation here, got it as clean as I could get it, uh, made sure that it wasn't uh, bleeding before the repair, made sure to get it nice and stable and dry. And then um, I had the canals completely cleaned up. I placed some paper points into the canals to make sure that nothing fell into them. And then I placed biodentine directly on the perforation. And then on top of the biodentine, I placed some of the blue BC liner to make sure that I had a really good seal so that way I could finish obturating the case. So after placing the blue BC liner, I cleaned it up and then you can see that the canals are still very clean. I was able to just clean them again now that everything was sealed from the perforation and then we were able to obturate. And then to reduce the risk of fracture in the future for the patient's tooth, we filled the entire rest of the access up with the blue BC liner. So it's interesting, you have a tooth of all different colors here. You have yep. the pink from the Fuji triage, the blue from the BC liner, and the bidentine. That's terrific. Now, one of the main points that I think the audience should understand is that the reason why you want to dry the space, right, where before you put your materials down, mm -hmm. because if you don't and you get blood or any type of a fluid between your materials and the dentin, that acts as a film that prevents the seal. And if you have microbes, then but once the material sets, then you haven't actually hermetically sealed the area, and you're going to be able to get um, microbial uh, contamination through that lack of seal. So that's why it's important to get it dry, even though your material might be hydrophilic. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to use a lot of harsh chemicals, but at the same time, if the patients, if that's part of the reason why actually it's important to seal immediately, because if you wait long enough and you have infection that is established, then that area is much more inflamed, it's much more difficult to dry as well. Terrific. So. That's great, uh, Stephanie. Thank you so much for sharing this case, well, these cases with us, this series. It was really educational. I think every case kind of had its own series of moments where things were important. People had to really pay attention to those parts. And then you kind of expounded on the whole thing, expanded on the whole thing with using literature. And that's wonderful. Th thank you so much again for sharing this and bring on more cases. And I'm sure everyone's going to love to learn from you and your cases. Keep up the great work. Thanks for having me.